Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. My name is Dr. Shelley Rotschafer, and I'm the director of the Contemporary Writers Series. I invite you to our second author performance of the season. To begin, I would like to tell you about our series. First, all of this would not be possible if it were not for our collaborative efforts. We are in our 23rd season. Our series was the brainchild of local published poets and English department faculty. I am proud to participate in this series as it has grown to include student representatives, novelists, world language professors, English and School of Education faculty, and our writing center. If you have participated in our programming board, please stand, whether you're staff, faculty, or students. We would like to applaud you. Oh my God. All right. Thank you. Our programming is dedicated to bring a variety of genres to campus. We have authors perform as journalists, poets, place-based poetry, ethno-poetry, nature writers, creative nonfiction testimonials, memoir, and fiction, whether novels or short story. Tonight, our author wears many of these hats. Here to help me welcome her is Aquinas student, Michael Ferry. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Rod Schaefer. Uh, hi, everyone. As she said, my name is Michael Fari. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to welcome you all to Aquinas College for tonight's Contemporary Writer Series featuring Dr. Kathleen Dean Moore. Um, Dr. Dean Moore hails from Corvallis, Oregon, and is a world-renowned, excuse me, is a world-renowned philosopher, writer, and climate change activist. Um, before Dr. Dean Moore began her full-time defense of our natural world, she was a distinguished professor of environmental ethics at Oregon State University. Um, we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Dean Moore here tonight to discuss not only her book Piano Tide, but a multitude of her different works and philosophies. In the time since her departure from Oregon State University, Dr. Dean Moore has become a highly respected voice of climate change discourse in the United States. She has turned her passion for the environment and passion for writing into an eloquent form of climate change activism with novels like Piano Tide, a work which I personally became acquainted with um, when I was assigned it twice for two of my English classes here at Aquinas. Um, first being Inquiry and Expression with uh, Dr. Rod Schaefer and the second being Writing Center Practice and Theory with Dr. Rumer. Um, Piano Tide, a uh, winner of a Will Catha Award for Contemporary Fiction, is an emotional story about an impassioned defense of our natural world by the citizens of a fi fictional town in Alaska named Good River Harbor. Um, Piano Tide, for me, highlights a very daunting parallel um, with our modern day society because a lot of it is about where big business interests um, are more important than like mankind protecting our natural world. Um, for me personally, this hits home because um, I'm a proud Southern Californian, love the beach, I'm a surfer, and so like I see our coastlines being used and abused daily um, in the name of profit through crazy stuff like waste dumping, deep sea trawling. If nobody knows what deep sea trawling is, it's essentially clear cutting of the ocean floor with giant nets. It's not great. Um, and so it causes a lot of damage to ecosystems, all that stuff. So for me, this draws a significant parallel to Axel Hagerman um, in Piano Tide, where he's just kind of doing whatever he wants with the resources um, for a profit. He's cutting down trees, damming up rivers, all that bad stuff. So. The thing for me is it feels, I, I feel like the citizens of Good River Harbor where I feel like it's impossible to make my voice heard um, in order to stop the way things are progressing. Um, so that, um, I guess, 
ominous dread um, about the future of ecosystems is one that raised a lot of questions and emotions for me while reading Piano Tide. Um, emotions strong enough that led me to writing a research paper about the coastlines and I mentioned uh, Dr. Dean Moore's work in my work. Um, that feeling is something that Dr. Dean Moore expresses very well in her storytelling um, through telling the story of a town of people who were not afraid to stand up for what they believed in no matter the cost. So um, Dr. Dean Moore tonight will be speaking for 40 minutes with a question and answer for him to follow. Um, after that, we will move to the Laudit Room where there will be a small reception with coffee, tea, and lemonade. If that isn't incentive enough, uh, sorry, incentive enough, I heard there will also be cookies, so I'll be there. Um, on behalf of Dr. Dean Moore, Aquinas College, and the Contemporary Writer Series, I thank everyone for being here tonight, and I ask you to please silence your cell phones. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dean Moore. Thank you, Michael. So, hello, saints. I bring greetings from the land of the Oregon State University Beavers. We um, can't talk, but we can whine. I, uh, we have Bernice and Bernie. What do you have? What do you call your St. Bernards? No, really. Nelson? Okay, that's not what I expected. <laughs> well, it's very nice to be here, and it's wonderful to see you out tonight. That surprises me to come to snow. I think that it's really extraordinary that we find ourselves together in this time as a hinge point in human history. You could drive a nail through this decade, and the fate of the Earth would swing in the balance. We're the last human beings who are going to have a choice. We can choose, on the one hand, to sit around and watch the life-saving systems of the planet fray and fall apart. Or, on the other hand, we could choose to become part of the greatest exercise of the human imagination the world has ever seen. There is no third option. I probably wouldn't have chosen this challenge myself, and I probably wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been my preference to be born to this challenge. I think if I had to choose, I would probably want to be born somewhere between the beginning of modern dentistry and the invention of nuclear weapons. But never mind, here we are, and the story of the next centuries is ours to write. In fact, for better or for worse, we're all writing the story of the future with every decision that we make. So the question is, what is going to be the story of these pivotal years? The story of global warming could be a crime novel. It could be a horror story with zombie cockroaches. The story of climate change could be scripture with all of its terror and grace. Or it could be one of those choose your own adventure novels, exciting the new ideas, these great leaps of imagination, this new sense of empowerment, this weepy joy of, of, of relief and redemption. But I am also betting that it's a thriller. But the story that I want to write with my decisions is, in the end, a love story. So I don't want anybody to confuse a love story with a romance novel. Uh, I tried writing a romance novel. Uh, that wasn't my best writing. In fact, I put, some, I put some sex scenes in my Piano Tide book, and when I gave it to my daughter to read, she said, um, Mom, I don't think you should try to write about sex. So I took most of it out, but I have to say that before I get done today, I will read you that scene. I promise you that. So I'm honored here to be part of the contemporary writers. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, and the rest of your team. I'm honored to be a nature writer in the Contemporary Writers Series. As you can imagine, it's a little bit complicated these days being a writer about nature. Um, and so I thought what I would do tonight is really do two things. I thought I might recount with essays a little bit of my journey as a nature writer. And then I want to turn 
more importantly, to the kind of journey we have together writing this new story of this new great transformation. Um, so we might call this the nature writer's journey into the Anthropocene. But I don't like that word at all. Anthropocene, um, as if human beings were in charge, as if we had finally, it just seems very arrogant to me, as if human beings had finally achieved mastery over geological history and could name the whole geological epic after themselves, Anthropocene. I've been thinking maybe it would be better to call it the um, unforgivable crime scene. Or better yet, ab, which means dump, plus scene, or um, scenum, which means filth. So we would be in the obscene epoch. At any rate, whatever we call it, we are here. And so here is the journey that I have taken to this spot that I wanted to share with you. So let's start. What is the work that a nature writer does? For that answer, we go to the poet Mary Oliver, who wrote in Messenger, my work is loving the world. Here, the sunflowers, there, the hummingbird, equal seekers of sweetness. Here, the quickening yeast, there, the blue plums. Here, the clam deep in the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? Am I no longer young and still not half perfect? Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. So that's a nice job description. Um, it was so simple. I was so in love with the world, and so were you, and so was Mary Oliver, and nature writing was a love song. So celebrating nature was easy. I would just go to someplace astonishing and open my heart and open my notebook. So let me read to you the first paragraph I ever published. I published it in the North American Review. And I wrote it about the time my daughter was your age, just heading off to college. I wanted my daughter to lie in the tent, breathing the air that flows from the Lamet River at night, dense with the smell of wet willows and river algae. I wanted her to inhale the smoke of a driftwood fire in air too thick to carry any sound but the rushing of the river and the croak of a heron startled to find itself so far from home. I wanted the chemical smell of the tent to mix with the breath of warm, wet wool and flood through her mind until the river ran in her veins and she could not help but come home again. Pure celebration. Pure, open-hearted appreciation of nature. And honestly, it was so straightforward that I'm ashamed to tell you that the hardest question that a nature writer faced back then was, what does a nature writer wear? It was that straightforward. So um, my daughter says, no problem. I will figure out your nature writer costume. And we went to the mall, and she started pulling things off the shelf, scarves, flowing robes, everything in shades of white, beige, cream. And she brought it all in, and I put it all on. La la da, I went out, and I said to my husband, so, do I look like a nature writer? He said, no. You look like a roll of toilet paper. So there you go. I solved that problem, but only immediately faced other ones. That was then. But what about now? I mean, now, being a nature writer becomes much, much more complicated. Understand. Loving the world is what I do for a living. It isn't easy. Because it was dawning on me that as I was celebrating this glorious world, it was slipping away. I had just written about frog song, and Walmart bulldozed the pond for a parking lot. I had just published an essay about a pine forest when it burned to the ground. And now, as I rejoice in humpback whale song, the whales are starving. And all the while, big oil executives, to increase their unimaginable profits, are devising business plans that would knowingly take down the great systems that sustain human life and all the other lives on Earth. Oh, the peril, the moral hazard, the planetary peril. 
Consider, I've been writing about the natural world since 1970. That was the first Earth Day. How many of you remember the first Earth Day? How many of you were born before, before 1970? <laughs> Just about right there, huh? Okay. Well, in that time, in our lifetimes, 40% of everything that has the breath of life, plants and animals, has disappeared from the face of the Earth. 40%. The populations of the birds that we love the most, the robins and the red-winged blackbirds, have been cut by a third. In that time, 39% of the terrestrial wildlife are gone. 39% of the marine wildlife is gone. 76% of freshwater wildlife is gone in 50 years. The greatest extinctions are in the poor countries, developing countries, with losses of 58%, where the wealthy nations are exporting their environmental devastation. Unless we act against climate change, I will die in a world that is half as abundant and rich and life-drenched as the world I was born into. My grandchildren will be able to tear out half the pages in their field guides. They will not need them. And it will take five to seven million years for the earth to recover the abundance and diversity it has lost in my lifetime. In 1970, when I started writing, as the great dying began, nobody really knew about climate change, except for ExxonMobil, their scientists, and they weren't telling. Uh, 10 years before uh, James Hansen warned Congress about climate change, Shell Oil scientists wrote an internal memo saying that burning fossil fuels will cause climate change with catastrophic results. Did they change course? <laughs> they did not. Bring it on. And now the oil and the gas industries now effectively control most federal agencies and environmental policy in the United States. Legislators who might have blocked them have been bought off in a monstrous corruption scandal rendered legal by the Supreme Court. And in its frenzy for long-term profit, there is no sign that the oil and gas industries will control themselves for the public good, for the sake of the future of life on the planet, not even to avoid inevitable financial ruin in the future. So here I am, a nature writer whose work is to love the world, whose work is to stand still and be astonished, watching the devastation of my subject matter, even as I was writing about it. And that became very complex. Remember my daughter who was going off to college when I wanted her to come camping on the river? In my next book, she definitely was not in a tent. And this notion of loving the world has taken on a very different meaning. So I'm going to read you an essay called The World Depends on This, which is from my second book of essays called Hold Fast. The message machine was blinking when I got home from work. I want you to know that your daughter is going to be fine. I braced myself for whatever would come next. She was arrested in the climate demonstrations. They're holding her in the San Francisco County Jail. I tried to picture a jail at night. Do the other inmates sleep, splay-legged and heavy on their backs? Do they curl up as if they were babies? And our daughter, surely she's sitting awake on a bench with her knees to her chest and her arms wrapped around them. She'll be cold in that dark place. Babies startle if they're not wrapped tightly. We learned that in a childcare class before she was born. Their bodies twitch, and their arms flail as they sleep. And if nothing is holding them, they are afraid. So you have to wrap a newborn baby. We held our daughter close and wrapped her in blankets, tight as corn in the husk. We loved her so much and raised her so carefully. And isn't this what all parents do? It never occurred to us that she would go to jail. So here's the first thing she said when she called collect from the holding cell. What can I say to keep you from worrying? 
to keep a parent from worrying. Tell us you're home in bed, I said. But my husband took the phone from my hand. She told him that she was in a holding cell with dozens of other women. They are strong, amazing women, many of them mothers and grandmothers, she said. And Frank thought that Aaron's own voice was strong and amazing, more certain than he had ever heard. The police released her at 2 a.m. in the morning. A friend came into the city to drive her home. Don't all parents want the world for their children? Fellow parents tell me, wouldn't we do anything for them? To give them big houses, we'll cut ancient forests. To give them perfect fruit, we'll poison their food with pesticides. To give them a ride to school, we will leak bunker oil in the last wild places. To give them the best education, we will invest in universities that profit from death. We go busily about buying this or that, voting or not, burning up gasoline or jet fuel or split pine on a small scale in the short term, making things work for our children, forgetting that whatever is left of the world is a place where they will have to live. Two days after she got out of jail, Aaron walked with us beside the ocean. Under a steep headland, we came across a jumbled heap of fishing nets, nylon cord, and bullwhip kelp intricately tangled. Buoys were smashed and buried beyond hope. This is what the world is, she said. She tugged at a rope in the nets gone to tangled ruin drifted with sand. Yes, but you don't have to go to jail to say so. There are other ways, I said softly, knowing I should be still. She answered as softly. Then you need to show me those ways, she said. Don't tell me. Show me. Dear God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to hope and what to fear, what to invest in and what to give up, what to insist on and what to refuse, how to go on with living in a time of death. All I know is how to hold my daughter, wrapping my arms tight around her shoulders. Right now, the world depends on this. So what is a nature writer to do? It's the craziest thing. Lots of times, not here, thank goodness, but lots of times when an organization asks me to talk or write about the climate crisis, the global extinction crisis, the crisis of ecosystem collapse, the diminishing prospects of the children, their request is very specific. Nothing grim. People don't want to hear grim. Nothing angry or alarmist. Nothing too dark. Give us reasons to hope. Well, for crying out loud, In a power-hungry, profit-driven frenzy of extraction and pollution, international megacorporations, in collusion with thuggish petro-states, are well on their way to turning Earth into Venus, which, I will note, does not support life. I guess this is what they don't want me to talk about. But under these conditions, what am I supposed to say? What is my work? What is my work? What is the work of a nature writer in these times? Because, um, and so this piece that I'm about to read comes from Great Tide Rising. Because I'm a literary writer writing about climate justice, people often ask me, what is the importance of arts in the climate struggle? I turn to Friedrich Nietzsche, a 19th century German philosopher. We have art in order not to die of the truth, he said. We have art in order not to die of the truth. Well then, Two questions. What are these lethal truths, these truths that break our hearts, our spirits, and turn us to stone? We know the answer to that question. It's these silent catastrophes. Well then, how can art save us in the face of those truths? Here's how I see it. Do you remember Medusa, the monstrous woman in Greek mythology? Medusa was a gorgon with such a terrifying face that no mortal could gaze upon it without dying. Do you remember this? The reptilian face, the hair, the poisonous hair dripping with snakes. A person who looked straight at Medusa would turn to stone. And isn't that the danger? That when people look straight in the face of the desperate truths of our times, they're turned to stone. Their hearts are hardened. They are unable to act, joyless. Inhumane, immobilized, they freeze into business as usual as if they had no choice. 
So enter the hero Perseus, who carried, along with his winged shoes and his magic scythe, a beautiful reflective shield. When he held the shield up and caught Medusa's ugly image, here was Medusa in the mirror of his shield, transformed, but not transformed, represented and revealed, revealed, revealed. And Perseus, seeing her in the reflection, seeing her in an entirely new way, faced her reflection boldly and cut off her head. So what is this reflective shield that can show us the danger without turning us to stone? What can open our hearts without breaking them? What can replace paralyzing fear with a new vision of what is beautiful and possible? What can break the bonds of denial and lies? The answer, of course, is the creative arts. The magic reflective shield. In a time of climate change, ecological collapse, and global injustice, art allows us to see hard truths without being destroyed by them, but rather lifted and heartened. The idea then being that what a nature writer's work is to do is to open people's hearts without breaking them. The only shield I have is this agonized decision to put catastrophes into the context of love stories. That's all I know how to do. This love story that I began with is a love story that I will live with. And if I can keep putting my stories into the context of love, maybe I can, with my reflective shield, encourage people to see these hard truths. So remember Aaron, who went to jail? First went to college and then went to jail. Here is a story from Great Tide Rising about her daughter. I am taking you through the generations. This one is called Ring the Angelus. All those years, the Swainson's thrushes were the first to call in the mornings. Their songs spiraled like mist from the swale to the pink sky. That's when I would take a cup of tea and walk into the meadow. Swallows sat on the highest perches, whispering as they waited for light to stream onto the pond. Chipping sparrows buzzed like sewing machines as soon as the sun hit the Douglas firs. If I kissed the knuckle of my thumb, they came closer and trilled again. Oh, there was music in the morning all those years. In the overture to the day, each bird added its call until the morning was an ecstasy of music. Evenings were glorious, too. Frogs sang and sang. They sang all evening and into the night. They sang while garter snakes, their stomachs extended with frogs, crawled finally under the fallen bark of the oaks and stretched their lengths against cold ground. I don't know how many frogs there were in the pond then. Thousands, tens of thousands, clumps of eggs like eyeballs in aspic. When the eggs hatched, there were tadpoles. I have seen the shallow edge of the pond black with wiggling tadpoles. There were that many, each with a song growing inside. In the years when the frog choruses began to fade, scientists said it was a fungus. When the bats stopped coming, they said that was a fungus too. When the goldfinches came in pairs, not flocks, we told each other the flocks must be feeding in a neighbor's field. No one could guess where the thrushes had gone. The fields were as empty as the perfect emptiness of a bell, the perfectly shaped absence ringing the angelus, the evening song, the call for forgiveness at the end of the day. In spring, when our granddaughter was born, I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled in the mud by the shore, but even then not as many as before. By then, the pond had sunk into its warm, weedy places, leaving an expanse of cracked earth. Ahead of the coming heat, butterflies fed in the mud between the cracks, unrolling their tongues to touch salty soil. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then, an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little body to my bones. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid, I will tell you, I was so afraid. 
poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a morning if I don't protect what creates its beauty? Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Ring the Angelus for the salmon and the swallows. Ring the bells for frogs floating in bent reeds. Ring the bells for all of us who did not save the songs. Holy Mary, Mother of God, ring the bells for every sacred emptiness. Let them echo in the silence at the end of the day. Forgiveness is too much to ask. I would pray for only this, that our granddaughter would hear again that little lick of music, that grace note toward the end of a meadowlark song. Meadowlarks. There were meadowlarks. They sang like angels in the morning. I no longer call myself a nature writer. I call myself an activist writer. And I have turned every ounce of my energy towards my mission, which is in every way I know how to bear witness to the glories of the earth and the sins against it. That is my work. But now I want to shift over to your work and the work that we will do together, because we will. Uh, we have some exciting work to do because we're going to have to rewrite everything. And won't that be a kick? How we understand who we are in relation to the earth and how we ought to live, of course, we have to rewrite that. That's basic. How we feed ourselves, how we educate ourselves, how we exchange goods and services, how we share land, how we work. How the power of corporations relates to the power of government. There's one. Who pays the real costs of consumption? Right. So how do you imagine a story so huge? Every writer knows the answer to that question. You write a story by writing it, sentence by sentence, scene by scene, bird by bird. The writer Anne Lamott wrote this. She said, 30 years ago, my older brother, who was 10 years old at the time, was trying to finish writing a report on birds that he had three months to write. <laughs> it was due the next day. He was at the kitchen table close to tears, surrounded by binder paper and pencils and unopened books on birds, immobilized by the hugeness of the task ahead. Then, Anne Lamott says, my father sat down beside him, put his arm around my brother's shoulder and said, bird by bird, buddy. Just take it bird by bird. And that is how we will write the story of the future. So let's begin. What's the setting? Earth, this beautiful blue marble in absolute balance, trembling there with wind singing across its melting poles. It could roll either way. Who's the protagonist of this story? Who's the hero? Well, that would be us. If it isn't us, it's nobody. This, we, we are Bilbo Baggins. We are Odysseus. We are Harriet Tubman. We thought maybe government would do this for us, but it apparently will not. In the absence of any meaningful government action, the major US actors in the struggle against climate change have to be long-standing civic and moral institutions. This is a civic and moral institution right here. Churches, cities, businesses, colleges, churches. But this is good, people. This is where the struggle should be. Because look at history. The anti-slavery campaigns, women's suffrage movement, civil rights movement, so many more have been led by the conscience of the streets. People walking out of a church holding hands and singing. 
The changes have not come from a sudden moral awakening on the part of the federal government. That is how it shall be. So it's us people. And that also is good. Because we were made for this time, exquisitely educated by dedicated faculty to be visionaries and leaders. You are experienced, you are interconnected like never before, and absolutely besotted with life, powerfully in love with your families, with the earth, with justice and freedom, with dreams of the future. If we can't do it, it can't be done. We are the protagonists, us. OK, so who are the antagonists, the bad guys? As in any good suspense story, this will become clear over time. We're only beginning to understand how complete, how knowing, how ruthless is the fossil fuel hegemony. If we want to start with a bad guy, I've got a good one for you. Back then, I was walking out of a meeting of the, American, or the Society for Environmental Journalists where a representative of the American petroleum industry had just spoken. The American petroleum industry is the biggest lobbyist for fossil fuels. Here we were, just the two of us, walking out of this room together. I thought, ah, this is by chance. So I decided to talk to him about love. And I said, so, do you have any children? <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? He turned to me, and this is what he said. First of all, understand, this is a huge man. He's shaved head. He's wearing a long black trench coat, and he's walking in shoes the size of aircraft carriers. I know when you're writing a book, and you're, you're not supposed to make your bad guys into stereotypes. This guy must stand in front of a mirror and say, hmm, do I look stereotyped enough? Do I look enough like a bad guy? So forgive me. Here's what he said. Leaned down over me, and he said, don't you ever, 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 ever underestimate the power of the fossil fuel industry. Yes, you get to be in my book. So we've got the setting. We've got the protagonist. We've got the antagonist. What is the genre? That is, what type of a story is going to be? OK. So I'm saying it's a thriller, whether we can stop the fossil fuels in time and draw down the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere before they pass the tipping points and runaway planetary change is inev inevitable. Some people say we have two years. Some people say we have 10 years. Some people give us maybe 20. What's the narrative here, the basic arc of the story? Now here we have a choice. We're writing the story, remember, so it's not writing us. And I want to argue that there are three possible storylines. And I'm following Joanna Macy here, the marvelous eco-Buddhist philosopher. Three paths we can follow. We could follow the path of business as usual, which would be a crime novel. We can write a story of a future that we might call the great unraveling, which would be a tragedy. Or we can write the story of the great work, the greatest and most thrilling exercise of the human imagination the world has ever seen the great turning at the absolutely last possible moment to save the sustaining planet. So let's take these various narrative frames one by one. Business as usual, we could write that story. It's the story of the industrial growth economy. We hear it from politicians, business schools, corporations, corporate controlled media. They say there is little need to change the way we live. Technological fixes are all we need. Economic recessions and extreme weather conditions are just temporary difficulties from which we will surely recover, or maybe even profit. That story is cruel fiction. It is fake news. By the second chapter, climate change will have overtaken this story, and I don't know the novelist who get, could get this to end well. What time do you want me to stop? I'll just tell you the two reasons. One is that business as usual is a failure of reverence for this beautiful world. It 
It's our reverence for the world. It's our love for the world. It's our joy in it. It's that glory that's the foundation of our obligation for its continuing. The same impulse that says, this is wonderful, is the impulse that says, this must continue. If this is the way the world is, extraordinary, surprising, beautiful, astonishing, mysterious, contingent, beloved, then this is the way I ought to act in that world, with gratitude and celebration, with caring and respect, and above all, with a sense of responsibility that it would continue to thrive. And there's a corollary to that argument. If the earth is sacred, then every act that diminishes or destroys any part of it is a sacrilege. It is a profanity. So the first reason why we can't continue with business as usual is that it destroys what is wonderful. And therefore, it's morally impossible. The second reason why we can't continue with business as usual is that it is creating a global injustice and is on track to become the greatest violation of human rights the world has ever seen. We can hear the crunch of unrestrained capitalism eating its own feet. We can see, we can smell the scorched brakes as we skid to a stop on this uber-Western, uber-capitalist dead-end road. We can hear the world cry out, all the messages it's sending us in the language of fire and storm. We know that an economy that prides itself on accumulating wealth instead of sharing it, a culture that gobbles up the fecundity of the planet instead of nurturing it, any economy of infinite extraction will kill off the sources of its sustenance. We know that if we don't put the brakes on climate change now, it probably can't be stopped. We know that when fossil fuel companies to make astonishing, unimaginable profits, show themselves willing to take down the systems that sustain life as we know it on Earth and cause suffering on a scale never before seen, when they do this knowingly, intentionally, for the sake of money, that is moral monstrosity on a cosmic scale. We know, and that knowing has a moral importance. Here's what the Dalai Lama said. It's not difficult to forgive destruction in the past, that resulted from ignorance. Today, however, we have access to more information. It is essential that we re-examine ethically what we have inherited, what we are responsible for, and what we will pass on to coming generations. So it's our knowledge that imposes this moral obligation on us. And you remember what Greta Thunberg said, little Greta. You say you understand the crisis, but I hope you don't understand. Because if you understand, and you keep doing the destructions that you're doing, I would have to think you were evil. So we can't let business as usual play itself out. It's a morally impossible story. We have to do better. But we've already plunged into this narrative, the next narrative framework, which is the great unraveling I will not pause here for very long because it's almost unbearable to think, to live in this world of despair. So let me ask you, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is there is no hope for us, no, one is there's no hope for us, and 10 is there's no problem for us, where are you? Think of a number between 1 and 10 that represents where you are in the scale of concern for climate change. May I see the hands of those who give themselves a 10? 9. 8. 7. 6. Hmm. 5. Four, three, two, one, zero. Maybe it's the weather, but I've never seen numbers like that before. It's very, very dangerous and it's a problem because here's the deal. We've built a society that's fixated on the future 
So we measure everything we do, right or wrong, by its consequences. So we built a society that can be completely disempowered by hopelessness. So here's the deal. We got a choice. You know, on the one hand, here's how people frame this thing. On the one hand, we could have blind optimism that everything is going to turn out no matter what we think. But that's a kind of moral abdication. Because if everything's going to be fine, no matter what I do, I don't have to do anything. Or we could adopt utter despair. No matter what I do, the world's going to go to hell, and there's nothing I can do about it. So I don't have to do anything. Hope, despair, I am off the hook. But that's a, that's a logical fallacy. It's the fallacy of a false dichotomy. Because between hope, blind hope on one side and blinding despair on the other side is this great essential middle ground, which is acting not out of hope, acting not out of, uh, failing to act not out of despair, but acting out of integrity, a wholeness, a moral wholeness, a matching between what you believe and what you do. To act for the earth because we love it. To live gratefully because life is a gift. To act reverently because the world is sacred, not because of the consequences of our actions. Not because we can save the world, but because that's what we believe. To live simply because we don't believe in taking more than our fair share. To act lovingly toward the world because we love it. So I don't think it's possible, I don't think it's psychologically possible to live in the narrative of the, of the great falling apart, the great unraveling. I think we have a third alternative, and that is the great work, the great turning, the great imagining. It's a story that we tell ourselves when we refuse to let despair rule us, when we refuse to carry on in immoral ways. But what we do is we help new and creative human responses to come forth to enable the transition from an industrial growth society to a life-sustaining society. The central plot is about joining together to act for the sake of the earth. We can choose this story for the future. It involves two things, stop and go. Stop. Our first op obligation is to stop the harm and bring an end to the harmful story. Immediately, stop building the infrastructure to support fossil fuels. No more coal trains, no more coal depots, no natural gas-fired power plants, no more pipelines, no new highways. Maybe you could fix some potholes, but that's about it. And go. Think about a better way to bring all of the powers of the human mind together to imagine, to do the work of creating a new and a beautiful story. Put a price on carbon that reflects its true costs. Switch to no-till agriculture and plant a plant-based diet. Plant a trillion trees. Give women the power to choose to bear children or not. All these things we can imagine a better way. People ask me, OK, but even together, can we really get it done? So I want to read you a story that I wrote from Alaska. I was a writer in residence at the Nali National Park. I was living in a little tar paper log cabin on the East Fork of the Toklat River. It was June. It was solstice. It was Alaska. It was murderously hot. At night on the porch of the cabin, 104 degrees, an all-time record. Even the doll sheep had come off the blazing mountaintops to stand in the river. There were all-time record numbers of mosquitoes. So I was lying half naked on the bunk, slapping mosquitoes. And next to the wall, my husband lay completely covered by a white sheet, as still and dismayed as a corpse, because he would rather be hot than bitten, and I would rather be bitten than hot. All the doors in the windows were open to let in any relief, even though the doors were studded with spikes, I mean like spikes, to discourage grizzly bears from breaking in. So we had another terrible choice, gnawed by grizzlies or roasted to death. If I heard any snuffling, my job was to leap out of bed and slam shut the door. So I had come to the Toklat River to think about global warming, and it was not going well. We are caught up in a river that's rushing towards a hot, stormy, and dangerous planet. The river is powered by huge amounts of money invested in mistakes that are dug into the very structure of the land. How will we ever change this current? 
I pulled on clothes and walked down to the bank of the river. The Toklat is a shallow river that braids across a good half mile of gravel beds, dried stream courses and deep dug channels. Sloshing with water from melting glaciers, their currents looked unpredictable and chaotic. But there were patterns. We are river people here, you are, I am. We've played in river currents since we were children. We know the rules of rivers. We know that any disruption that slows a river can reshape the current. Where the water piles against an obstacle, it loses energy, drops its load, and makes an even bigger obstacle, yes? And we know that as water circles around that obstacle, the current's own force turns it back upstream, yes? When there are so many obstacles and islands that a channel can't carry all its water and sediment, it crosses a stability threshold and the river finds a different way. With any disturbance, the downstream force of the river turns against itself. Disturbance creates more disturbance. So I shoved a rock into the river. The changing current made me grin. We don't have to stop the river. Our work, large and small, collective and individual, is to make a deflection in complacency, an obstruction to profits, a blockage to business as usual, stoppage to the lies, then another and another to change the energy of the flood. And as it swirls around these snags and subversions, the current will slow, lose power, eddy in new directions, and create new systems and structures that change its course forever. Choose your stone and chuck it in, people. Skip in a bunch of stones, or get together with your friends and roll in a boulder. Heave in a log or the rib cage of a drowned raccoon. It doesn't matter. Get in the way. Build something new. And learn this word, avulsion. A-V-U-L-S-I-O-N, avulsion. It's a hydrological term for the moment when the stream bed has so many blockages that it can't carry its load, and it flips overnight and carves a new direction. So this is our great work, to tell the stories of the new civilization, a civilization that's based on what ecologists and every religion of the world are telling us, that we are fully members of a beautiful, astonishing, contingent community of living and dying. It's too late for the invincible ignorance of business as usual. It's too late for the tear jerkers of the great unraveling. We're not trying to save our way of life. We're trying to save the world from this way of life's destructive power. There has to be a better way. So let me read you this scene that I promised I would read you. This will be my closing story. So we have the situation where Rebecca is plotting to blow out a dam. This is Piano Tide. And in fact, she is plotting to blow out precisely the dam that her husband, Axel, is building. Okay. <clears throat> With the free edge of her bandana, Rebecca swiped at tears as she climbed across the meadow. So here is the greatest mystery. What kind of person would dam salmon from a river? What kind of person would cut off salmon when they are moving most urgently, stop them just short of home after they have traveled a thousand miles to get there? Who could do that? Who could deny them? Hundreds of fish struggling upstream. How could that ever be right in what morally corrosive world? Dam a river, and salmon will throw their bodies against the dam until their faces are white with torn flesh. Then they would fin slowly in the cold tail water, stinking and dying like drunks outside the door at the Greyhound station. In that mountain meadow, the silence was a holiness Rebecca almost remembered, water flowing onto rock in the stillness of the mountain. The words she wanted to say to Axel tumbled through her mind. We'll come back here when it's over, Axel. You'll sit beside me and never once think about how you could market the meadow. You'll think about how beautiful it is and how strong I am and how blessed you are to be in this place. We'll tell the story of the flood we sent into the valley to save your soul. We will make love then. It will be awkward, our rubber raincoats squeaking and sticking together. We will laugh and tug at the endless layers. Is there no end to this tugging and pulling, you will moan? Is there any way to get off a boot but to hop and yank? 
but then our clothes will be in a pile in the blueberry bushes and we'll stand naked in our woolen socks. You will stroke my hair away from my cheeks and hold my face in your hands using your thumbs to wipe the rain from my eyelashes and you will say, maybe you mumble this into my hair. You will say, we can find a better way, Rebecca. There has to be a better way. Yes, there has to be a better way. Thank you. Okay, so in Piano Tide, uh, you talk about Soren Kierkegaard, you talk about Dostoevsky, and then you mention the myth of Sisyphus. So existentialism has uh, all three of those in common. And I was wondering like, what the relation from existentialism to environmental philosophy was. Super. My favorite character in my whole book is the philosopher. <laughs> He's marvelous, I think. I mean, I love him. Um, he pretends to be insane by saying the truth in a very loud voice. Was it a surefire way to have people think that you're insane? He is, in fact, an existentialist. Um, the terrible thing is that I had to kill him. I didn't want to kill him. I mean, I tried to kill the teenagers instead, but they wouldn't die, so he had to go. And he had to go in a crummy way that had to do with a grizzly bear. So I lost my existentialist philosopher, and I lost my favorite character about 2 thirds of the way through the book. And my heart was broken. But I consoled myself <laughs> with his lasting legacy. And yes. Um, what was it he quoted Kierkegaard saying? When you are called, will you answer? Perhaps in a whisper. Yeah. When you're called, will you answer? Perhaps in a whisper. So I wasn't trying, trying to make a big point with the existentialism, but I wanted him to be wise. And I think that a lot of what the existentialists say is really, really wise. So um, I won't be able to spin this into a into a discourse on existentialism, but um, I, I stuck it in there every, every chance I had. Thanks for letting me think about this guy again. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the things my, one of my teacher had me do before coming here today was read one of your papers, the Leaping Lizards one. And I was, feel, and I was wondering how you feel like that would impact what you have said with piano tiles and everything. Students are getting smarter and smarter. <laughs> OK, so the Le Leaping Lizard essay was, uh, I think, published by the Center for Humani Humans and Nature. And it was an argument for um, the rights of natural objects. And it was working with legislation in Ecuador uh, about the rights of Pachamama, Mother Earth, um, such that natural objects like rivers and mountains and bays and so forth can claim violations of their rights when they're damaged, not, not because it hurts human beings that they're damaged, but because it hurts them. So they can sue on their own behalf, and they can take their, and when there is a settlement, it comes to them, the river, the mountain, the bay. Um, so what it is doing is it's arguing for the inherent value and the, and the rights-bearing status of, of, non of not non-human things. Um, and of course, that's what the big conflict in Pianotide is, too between these two worldviews, the worldview that says that, that everything that exists out there is a commodity, that's Axel, and the, the worldview that says that everything that's out there 
has value and it has rights and it has, has value that inheres in itself and rights that it can claim for itself. So, so the, main, the main plot twist, the main conflict in Pianotide is between two worldviews, although it may as well be between two people. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And of course, the, the worldview that, that Nora represents um, is the one about the rights of nature. Mm -hmm. So gosh, your teacher made you read my stuff? <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> Thank you. You have it.